think this is what they would like to be. I think a guy who wears gym shorts when it's yeah, we're gonna get started here. Um, welcome everybody to um, whatever the community seminar series, whatever we call it. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, a former student to you all, uh, somebody whose naval architecture career was cut short by the Olympics. Um, <laughs> she grew up in Ann Arbor, went to Ann Arbor Pioneer, captain of the women's swim team, class of 2013 and 2014. Ended up working for a local naval architecture firm in Ann Arbor, uh, world class athlete, Belgian triathlon team, 2020 Belgian Olympic team, and a 2020 Olympian in the triathlon. Thank you. Oh, it's so cool to see so many faces. Thanks, guys, um, for coming down. Yeah, it feels like just yesterday I was sitting here staring at these propellers, trying to pay attention in class. And um, yeah, it's just really awesome to be back. So like Warren said, I'm Val Bartholomew. I'm 2014 graduate and a professional triathlete now, representing Belgium in international competitions. You can see these are just some highlights from the games this summer. Lots of pictures, like an amazing experience. This past summer, I fulfilled my childhood dream. I, I'm an Olympian. I finished 10th in the individual triathlon and 5th in the mixed team relay. And most importantly, I can just proudly say that I achieved this goal. My experiences at Michigan totally set me up for the success. Um, you may not may or may not have noticed by now, but engineering is pretty hard. <laughs> it's, naval architecture is pretty hard, let's be honest, even though it's the best program on the engineering campus. Being a Division I athlete is also extremely difficult, and doing both of those at once was pretty hectic, let's say. I wasn't a kid that grew up building Legos. I wasn't a sailor. I didn't have a boat. My dad and my brother were engineers, and I was stubbornly allergic to the idea of being an engineer myself. I chose engineering because while I was in LCNA, floundering, kind of unsure what direction I wanted to go in, I was taking Calc 3 as a freshman, and I, I looked around and everybody's asking me, why are you taking this class? Are you a math major? No. Are you an engineer? No. Like, why are you in this class? And I was like, I don't really know. My senior high school teacher told me I should probably take Calc 3 as a freshman for a semester. And so I, so I did. And so I kind of wanted to make use of these credits. And I looked out to see what was out there. And engineering seemed like an interesting option. Similarly, on the swim team, I was more the, is a really hard worker. Great, brings a great attitude to the team. I'm a GPA booster captain material type of athlete, certainly not pegged as a future Olympian. In fact, in my four years here at Michigan, I scored a grand total of one point at Big Ten Championships. One point, four years for one point. I never made NCAAs. Um, that was my senior year. And the 400 IM, the event that everybody avoids, I scored one point. I came to Michigan purely for academic desires, and I was just good enough to walk on on the swim team. So why did I decide to swim? I would like to do really hard stuff. During my time here at Michigan, I struggled a little bit, both with my identity as an engineer and my identity as a swimmer. The classes never felt easy. I had to work really, really hard to feel competent. I sat where you guys are sitting now, cramming my lunch while professors droned on about hydrodynamics, no offense. <laughs> I asked for life advice over a cup of coffee with Warren Noon before major exams. And I spent many evenings locked in computer labs here in the name building, grinding away for senior lab classes until well, well past 4 a.m. It was really the hardest I've ever worked, ever. Through it all, my time at Michigan brought me everything I needed. The camaraderie accomplishment of being an athlete, 
a department willing to rearrange class scheduling so I could fit my classes in between my practice hours, six to eight in the morning, 2.30 to 4.30 in the afternoon. A program advisor who knew how to be there as a counterweight during stressful times. And then of course, countless professors willing to open their offices for a chat, homework help, and at times some tough love. I had friendships with my peers, memorable trips to this Navy conference, which I heard you guys all just came back from, and a passage into the warm embrace that is the community that is naval architecture. I wouldn't have made it through those years had it not been for the family I found on North Campus. When I graduated from Michigan, I was able to get a part-time work as a naval architect here in Ann Arbor, actually. I had met my bosses, Connie and Brant Savender, through the awesome alumni network from Maine. And my first two years after graduating, I didn't live by the ocean, but I was able to work part-time here in Ann Arbor while dipping my toes in professional triathlon. When it was clear I needed to choose one or the other to truly maximize my potential or commit to 30 hours or 40 hours to build my career as a consultant or you know, stop getting injured and sick and recover and spend time on sleep and nutrition and focus full-time on professional triathlon. My bosses encouraged me to pursue my dream full-time. I also had the confidence and peace of mind that if my Olympic dream didn't work out and I didn't qualify for the Olympics, I'd have naval architecture to fall back on. Finally, the money I earned working as a naval architect for the first two years literally funded my first year as a professional triathlete. And in that time, I was able to produce the results at six at European Championships, third the next year at European Championships, and secure contracts full time as a professional athlete. I thought qualifying for the Olympics would be hard, and it was. I learned a new language, moved across the world a couple times, broke a few bones, suffered a few bike crashes. I sacrificed birthdays, Christmases even the weddings of some of my closest friends in a singular pursuit. I went from finishing last in races, running 50 minutes in the 10K, to running 35 minutes in the 10K and winning championship medals. I got everything I could out of my journey. And when I look back, I realized that all that uncertainty I had as a student, those long hours studying or swimming, set me up perfectly for this achievement. It taught me that I can really achieve anything through hard work and good community. I feel at peace with what I've accomplished and grateful I was willing to make the tough choices and sacrifices to achieve my dream. When I stand here now in front of you guys, having achieved my goal, I hope what shines through in my story is that really anything is possible. And your time at Michigan will give you the tools and that inner confidence to pursue what anything. If I can achieve what I did, being the person I was here at Michigan, struggling to keep up in the pool and in the classroom, unsure of my identity and ability in both, you can also pursue what sets your soul on fire. I encourage you, to, to, you all to be bold and take advantage of the connections this department offers. And don't worry if your path takes an unconventional route. If there's anything I've learned, that's often where the best surprises in life come from. I don't know what I'll do next. Maybe I'll get another run for Paris, the next Olympics, or maybe I'll hang up my head cap. But when I need a friend to chat over a cup of coffee and talk about the future and life choices, I know I'll call Warren. <laughs> you ready? <laughs> or Professor Troche, or any of the other professors and staff that have helped me along the way, and I'll always be in good hands. Thank you. So I love any questions. If anybody has any questions, um, you know, I hope what shines through in that is not that you guys also need to be Olympians, but um, yeah, just that you really can achieve more than you expect coming out of Michigan. And um, it really does set you up. It's a, it's a bit of a cheesy thing to tell you when you're here, but I really do believe that's what makes you resilient. That's what makes you open-minded. That's what opens doors. And you always have this degree to fall back on, no matter what you do. That's a pretty cool place to be.
Yeah, go for it. So you said you like swam in college. So yeah. that wasn't like one of the harder things to learn for the triathlon. Did you find okay. running or biking? Um, yeah. Yeah. So running is really difficult coming from a swimming background because it's just the impact. Um, so there was like a few years of transition to like have good form and then not get injured and not overdo it. You have a great engine, but your body's not ready for that kind of load. So it, it took, like I said, running 48 minute 10 Ks, which to give you perspective, like I laugh about that because the girls that I compete against are never running slower than 40 and the range that we're looking at is like 33 to 35. So it was a, a huge step to get from where I was to where I, I went. Um, and not many people start at that bottom, but when you start that low, you have, you can only go up. So um, yeah, it was a fun journey. I have a funny story. <laughs> so we were, we were, myself, my wife, and my kids were watching you. And my wife, Sharon, said, didn't you, like, try to get her to do a PhD with you? I go, yeah. And then my daughter says, well, of course, my daughter wasn't thinking. Well, what'd she say? I said, well, clearly no. And then my son said, well, obviously, she made a much better choice. <laughs> you're, like, going to the yeah. No, I remember that. And, you know, I feel like I had a couple opportunities for that. And that's what's so cool. Like, there were a lot of doors open, and um, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, trust me, we're done. I can be known as the person who tried to do a PhD, and clearly, you made the right call. Yeah, yeah. Um, at what point in your swimming did you start like considering triathlon? Because there's not much time. Yeah, yeah. No, that's true. Um, yeah, it wasn't really until I finished swimming, actually, and. It, it was another one of those random Michigan connections. Um, my coach at the time, my swim coach at Michigan, knew of a coach in town in the Ann Arbor that had a big triathlon history. And he ended up being my first coach in the sport. At the time, he there was a program that if you ran a certain amount, like certain like time over a 3K, and you had been a swimmer in college, USA Triathlon was really interested in your abilities because that's sort of what funnels into the best athletes in the sport. So I really came across good people on my path and I was hooked. Yeah. You're to focus on triathlons, like what was that like, like oh. psychological? Like yeah, for sure that's what I tell people was the hardest part of my career because like you know you start working and you feel like hey i'm an engineer and i just i graduated with this great degree mom and dad are proud <laughs> good you can finally go off and work and make some money and i was doing that and i was like did i have this like desire and i i don't know like i'm living in an arbor this is not like exactly a triathlon mecca if i really want to do this i need to move somewhere warmer or there's mountains where i can be challenged um it was really hard from the moment i like said it out loud to my at the time boyfriend and now husband i it took me about a year to really commit to like leaving the job moving across the world and it was a process and i think for sure that was the hardest moment in my career because i didn't have any funding i didn't have any guarantee results it was really like i know i kind of have some potential potentially if everything goes up right but i like i'm gonna have to make a lot of sacrifice uh, moving to another country where I mean, I'm Belgian, but I speak French. Anyway, it's complicated. I also speak Dutch. I was living on the Dutch side. It felt like I was living in China. I mean, like it was quite a big change. And that's why like, I like to tell that story to you guys, because those moments, like you're really unsure and you feel like, where do I go next? And that it's not saying you need to quit your job and do something crazy, but even making a career like switch and, and I don't know, pivoting within your company, like trusting that your instincts are right in those moments. I feel like it always paid off for me. Um, it was always the right decision if I made it with the right intentions at the time. And that was the biggest example of that being absolutely the right decision for me. It was hard though, for sure. Okay. Some injuries along your journey. What was that recovery process, both physically and mentally? Yeah, injuries are the hardest part of this. Um, it was hard. Like, as a swimmer, I didn't ever get injured. 
So I'd never gone through it before. And then like my first injury was like plantar fasciitis, just like a little, it's a really annoying foot injury. And I was out of commission for six months. And I think I was, I think I suffered some depression at the time. Like I didn't really realize what I was going through. Um, and then later on the injuries were when I had like the year I was like, I fell off my bike and I broke my sacrum and then I tripped while I was running Valerie and I broke my arm. Um, you know, like each time I would come back and I would just like have this boost in results. And it was like, came back from that, got third in a world cup, came back from the other one, six months later, got second in a world cup. And it, those were the moments that actually qualified me for the games. So funny enough, like out of, you know, out of that struggle was this like, just intense, like commitment to like, oh, I'm back. I want to do this. Like watch out world. Like that was when I was at my sharpest actually. Yeah. Oh, for it, one. Do you have any advice for the seniors right now? Yeah, you know, you guys are kind of facing an interesting time, which I'm actually curious to hear from you what it's been like the last two years. Obviously, unconventional past two years of studying. I'm sure that affected the experience here. But like, really, what I would say is, <clears throat> you know, don't worry about having to have it figured out. Like everybody cared so much to ask me, like, what are you going to do next when you're graduating? What's, what are you going to like work? And I think it comes out from a place of like, they just care about you and they want you to be okay. But you like, trust me when like a year from then, nobody's going to care what you do or what you chose or like, and that's freeing in a lot of ways because, hey, you can do whatever you want. Like with this degree, you are opening doors for yourself. And you can work in a lot of different industries. And I would say, like, don't be afraid to like try it out, try something out, and change and do something different. And like, I'm 30, and I think I, when I was 23, 24, I was so stressed about that. And now I, like, I know I'm going to be fine. Like, I don't know what it's going to look like, and it's going to take a while to figure that out. But like, I really don't feel that burden anymore. Um, and I just encourage you guys to take that pressure off yourselves take the, all the time you need to decide what that looks like for yourself. Yeah. Okay. What does your average day look like? <laughs> um, a lot of eating. <laughs> you know, we, we train often three sports a day, actually, once you're at this level. So it's about a 30 hour training week, which means that like I swim five days a week. So I start my day with the swim an hour and a half, and then I'll go have second breakfast, I'll go out for a ride anywhere between an hour and a half and two and a half hours, come back, and I'll usually do an easy run in the evening, and then we'll have to sprinkle in the hard sessions throughout the week. Um, but yeah, I'm like, I'm on training camp 11 months out of the year. This is just an abnormal time for me because the Olympics finished, and I haven't seen my family in two years because of COVID and the Olympics. Um, so I'm here around, going around, all around the U.S. and seeing everyone, but... Yeah, generally it's full on. Like there's no weekends. I don't have a days off. I train Monday through Sunday. Um, yeah, it's a full time commitment. Okay. Yeah. Can you talk about the difference of training with for the mixed team relay versus the individual and like how that differed? Yeah, the mixed team relay is interesting because it was the first time that we've ever had that. So it's, that's the team, the Belgian team. There's two, it's two men and two women which is cool because this games, they were incorporating mixed relays across several sports. Um, I love that, being a female, being part of the engineering department, feeling a little bit like a feminist. Like I love that they're encouraging men and women competing together. We had an awesome team. We just happened to have a good generation of Belgian athletes right now. Uh, so we were fifth, um, just shy of the medals, which is quite a tough pill to swallow. But um, yeah, it was, a, it was amazing. Like you, that was part of the relay. And what became important actually was hydrodynamics, uh, hydrodynamics, aerodynamics a lot more than, see, I'm like back in the world again. <laughs> aerodynamics actually became a focus for a lot of federations, which is interesting because the bike leg is like four miles and over the individual distance, it's like some 40K, so 26 miles. But actually, it was much more important in the relay because it's, you were spread out more. So there was less drafting um, than you have when you have 55 women on the start list. Here, you were maybe like two or three in a group. 
So that really like all of a sudden there was like innovation on that, custom aero bars to fit the dimensions of a road bike. Um, I mean, thousands and thousands of euros invested in that, which was really kind of fun to be part of. And then additionally, they were doing all sorts of um, innovation with pedals. And like when you jump on the bike, you have your bike shoes clipped in. But then there were like they were trying to create these pedals that you would have your running shoes already in the bike and you would like jump in and then if you click a release lever the clip would open up and you would be able to basically rack your bike with already your running shoes on which would save you like a second and transition it sounds like nothing but over that distance that's what divided the metals and so like it was just like the first time this was all coming part of the sport i didn't answer your question at all actually <laughs> now that i'm thinking about it but um no you know what we didn't really change our training very much to be honest <laughs> no it's not evolved that much yet i do think that you're going to see more people specializing in that distance so it's like it's basically like running a marathon and running like i don't know 1500 like essentially the distance of a the time distance of an olympic is like two hours and here in the real I, I race for 15 minutes so it's quite a different set of skills and i think in the future we'll see younger athletes participating in that more but here it was all new and i don't think anybody really did much different we just prepared as regular triathletes yeah. um in watching the biking portion when the roads were slick, it looked crazy dangerous. Like, how do you balance yeah. wanting to go fast with not wanting to? Like, yeah, you know, it's so <laughs> ironic. It's like we, so it didn't rain at all in Tokyo for months. And the morning of our race, a uh, typhoon, no, cyclone, I don't even know. No, I think it was, they call it typhoon there, came in. Um, yeah, so it was just pouring rain. And I had done 25 sessions in a heat chamber at like, let's say 35 degrees Celsius. So. Uh, now I'm like totally in the metric system, but you know, pretty hot and very high humidity um, to prepare for those hot and humid conditions. And then, you know, we're standing there waiting and it's pouring and we're all cold. <laughs> we're like, what? What is this? Uh, just totally an example of expect the unexpected, right? Like totally an essential lesson to be like faced with. But, um, you know, yeah, it was dangerous. Like girls were falling left and right. And the only thing is like you, the girls that were good at handling, which means like cornering and being confident in the turns were the ones that succeeded in this race. It caused the dynamics to be that the field was just fractured into many bike, bike packs because the speed was, it was hard to get up to speed. It was hard to get girls working together as they were a little bit scared and hesitant in the turns. Um, yeah, you mainly just have to adjust the tire pressure. That's like the biggest thing and you have to have good um good tires that are good in the rain and that was something that i had like taken care of before the game so uh thankfully my my husband is like cook mechanic um you know he does it all so we had really gone through all this equipment and maybe i was one of the few that was actually really ready for those that to be a possibility of the race yeah okay so i feel like whenever i'm like running long distances or swimming long distances the only thing i can think of is like i can't wait for this to be over <laughs> what's going through your head like is it structured like you know the route? it probably should be a little structured <laughs> you, like, can't wait to get this over. <laughs> yeah it's such a roller coaster like in the swim like there was a part well before the race like they delayed it and i'm like what's going on here this is so weird like 15 minutes later was right okay whatever <clears throat> yeah you dive in and you're like oh god i'm like there's 50 people in front of me like i'm last for sure i'm last and then my cap fell off and i'm like oh my hair is gonna look great during this race <laughs> no honestly those are literally some of the thoughts and i'm like okay valerie back in the race like focus um you know i worked a lot on like actually it's not, I don't want to say meditation because it's not cheesy, but it's really focused training. And I really worked on that. And it was just like bringing myself back to where I was. But like, yeah, to be honest, halfway through the bike, I like looked up at the scoreboard and I'm like, oh my God, there's only six girls in front of us. Like, that's really cool. <laughs> um, yeah, I had no idea where I was in the race. And it, it was just a really fun experience to just like live it like that. You know, it was like pretty normal, <laughs> let's say. Like, I know it sounds like crazy to say that it's Olympics, but yeah, it's just any other race at the end of the day. And I'm glad I experienced it in that way. And I wasn't like so stressed and nervous and 
that I couldn't even enjoy um, the experience. Yeah. Uh, outside of going to Tokyo, what's been your favorite city to visit and compete in? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Like I've really gotten to see a lot, which is pretty was been part of the drive reasons I wanted to do this. Um, I don't know. Like I've been to Tongyang, South Korea, which is actually beautiful. Um, China, Kazakhstan, Astana, and Kazakhstan. That was pretty interesting. Um, Cozumel actually it's close but it's beautiful um yeah this year we've raced in London Jersey Island not New Jersey it's in the UK um <laughs> it's confusing I, I was confused as well um Hamburg Munich I mean Paris yeah Tokyo I think Tokyo is so cool thankfully I was there two years before so I actually got to see the city itself but racing in like in the streets in this major city and you're like it's just incredible. It's cool that they have put the venues in these <clears throat> interesting locations. Australia, um, yeah, I've been a lot of places. It's hard to pick one. <laughs> People ask me that a lot. I should really brainstorm before, so I have an answer. Um, how much are you in it, like by yourself? Like obviously, you're the only one running, and swimming, all that. But versus how much are you in it with the team in terms of like figuring out those innovations, like the bike shoes or the yeah, it seems like a lot. Of it does. Yeah. Um, with the mixed team relays, you know, when you have a relay at the games, your your Olympic committee gets more funding if you do well than an individual sport. So there was pressure from the Olympic committees to the travel federations to have good good equipment, good preparation and all that. So we had a lot of support from our federation with respect to the aero bars and we, but we also were able to give input like, Hey, we've heard this is really good. Or we want to do wind tunnel testing to yeah, further know if our bike setup and our bike position is actually aerodynamic or if we're just kind of guessing here. Um, and like now that I've made it up to this rank, I, like I have good funding and I, I always have a coach with me at races and, and physio support. So it doesn't feel like I'm alone, but to get to this point was like many, many years of like just Carl and I, which is my husband, like, all right, if I want to qualify for the Olympics, like let's read the rule book of world triathlon and like, what do I need to do? Like how many races, how does this work? Where are they? Um, so yeah, for sure. For sure. That was like a solo journey of like, okay, how do I, even get on the scene, get on the map and get on this track. Um, but now I'm pretty well supported. Yeah. Did you hear about that one Nike shoe that was banned from the Olympics? Yeah, they didn't ban anything in triathlon, funny enough. They banned stuff in on the track, um, but we were able to use any equipment we wanted. Did you ever use that shoe? I've, I'm not sure which one exactly you're talking about, but like the one I'm racing in is like the newest, one of the newest models. Actually, they have one after that, but people said it wasn't very good. So I just stuck to the other. Um, it's called the Next Percents. Um, actually, I think there's another name for it, but I always call it the Next Percents. Yeah, no, it's interesting because I was part of swimming, probably. I don't know if anybody was is a swimmer, but when they had the fast suits that were like mm -hmm. down to your yeah. ankles. And that was my like in high school and like some people never broke their times from what they swim in high school because of these this equipment which later got banned um for being too fast and too buoyant and and now i'm part of this generation of running shoe evolution and like they cost 250 euros like 300 dollars to buy and like they're kind of constantly coming out with new ones and it's true if you don't wear it you really aren't as competitive so that's the that's the uh, next percent. They have a carbon um, plate in it, and so now they're designing ones with two carbon plates. And it's kind of fun because they it's it's fun to like try these this equipment on, and like I really do think it changes your form, which can make you more efficient. And it's part of the reason I think that I've gotten faster over the 10k because uh, my form needs this like bounce at the back of it to like sort of elongate and make myself a bit more fluid. Um, so for sure, I've benefited from that. Maybe even more than a natural runner that already has a really good stride uh but yeah it's it'll be interesting to see like how far they're going to push that and like mm -hmm. to what now asics is coming out with it. every company is coming out with these fast shoes um so it's it's kind of cool to be part of that evolution technology right now
you ever buy like a couple pairs of shoes just in case they like get discontinued but you want to keep using them <laughs> <laughs> well if they get discontinued it's probably because they can't use them in races which oh, true. then would be just like sinking my money into a bunch of shoes yeah. <laughs> so, unfortunately nike's not super interested in sponsoring triathletes at the moment so yeah we are buying those things that equipment ourselves but yeah, I'm traveling right now with my bike and I have like three pairs of fast shoes and they're like, what am I doing with that? Just like paying more luggage fees, but you know, it's part of the game. So you just got to play along. Yeah. Um, being like a varsity athlete and engineer are both like really big time commitments. So like, how did you find that balance? And do you think like being involved in both of them prevented you like ever from like performing at your like absolute best and a respective one? Um, I don't think it really prevented me in engineering, thankfully, but I do think now that I'm a professional athlete and I take care of my body and I sleep 12 hours a night uh, and I don't stay up till 4 a.m., like there are significant advantages to that. Um, and, you know, the food and the nutrition and not having to balance that. I do think like it sounds weird, but like being 30 also amplifies that. Whereas like you can get away with more when you're 20 and 21 in these endurance sports. Um, there is a side that though, that I felt like because I was always like running down to the South campus and like having to like go to these like commitments with swimming that I didn't like bond very well with my class. Um, Cause I was just like not around and not available for like projects and stuff. But what was cool is like, the program here helps me coordinate so that my fifth year I could do like fit the last two classes I needed from undergrad and start my master's the same semester, which I don't know if I'm supposed to say that I did that. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was able to like, ex like do those classes that I couldn't fit while I was swimming while also doing my master's and finishing in one year with my master's. Um, which was awesome because that was when I started swimming and I bonded really well with the class below me and I felt like I still got that experience. Um, yeah. But I mean, like, that's to say, like, like, I hope it didn't scare you guys by saying, like, it was really, really hard. I'm, I'm just trying to, like, give you perspective. Like, if you are struggling now, or if you're, like, feeling like these classes are tough, maybe not. Maybe you're just, like, living your life and having a great time. Great. <laughs> um, that, like now being what I've done is like okay yeah this is hard but it's nothing like what I was balancing here and I'm glad I went through that because it made this feel more achievable and it made like anything living anywhere doing speaking any language more achievable and I think that's what you can get excited about and that's what can get you through those tough times hopefully Anyone else? Okay. Can you just talk about like the mental state of like walking on to the varsity team? Yeah. How that, how that was and how you kept Yeah, it was hard because I'd always like I grew up in Ann Arbor. I was here like in the era that like Michael Phelps was preparing for his like major eight games, um, eight, eight medals at, at Beijing. So I like was a part of the swimming community and it was always a dream to swim here, but it felt like it was pretty far off with where I was at in high school. Um, and then I just happened to prove right at the last time and it opened the door to that possibility. But uh, it was hard because I felt like um, like it didn't come as easily to me as it did to the other girls. And not many, like only one other girl on the team was an engineer in the four years I was there. So like nobody was really balancing that commitment except for me, which in the end, she became like my best friend and <laughs> she officiated my wedding. So, hey, you brought a great friendship out of it. But yeah, it was hard. It was, and that was what I struggled a bit with, like my identity a little. And like, well, like I want to be a swimmer, but I also like I'm trying to be this engineer. And like, I don't really feel like I'm doing either very well at some points. And uh, yeah, it was really tough. But like, I don't know, like I said, like those moments really do make you stronger, as cheesy as it sounds. And make you the person that you become and open doors. So it was worth it. Yeah. Thanks guys. If you have any other questions, also I'm always available by email if you want to chat or yeah, speak about anything. I'm always available. So maybe Warren, you can send out my contact information. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for coming and listening to me talk.